Hello, welcome to Citizens Forum. It is Wednesday, February the 12th. I'd like to start by thanking the volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every couple of weeks. My first guest is Tyson Strandlund. Uh, Tyson ran for the Communist Party in the last federal election. And one reason I'm having him on is that a friend of mine went to a couple of the all candidates meetings and he said that after the meeting it was Tyson of the Communist Party, not the NDP, not the Greens, not the Liberals, not the Conservatives, who had the most people gathered around talking to him. So I thought that sounded interesting. We're going to start by talking about something that's going on now, which is February the 12th, which is the, what's happening around the issue of the coastal gas pipeline, that horrible fracked gas pipeline that John Horgan and corporate Canada are shoving down everybody's throats if I'm not speaking too strongly. Uh, no, absolutely. I mean, um, uh, I've been at the legislature uh, here in Victoria the last several days and I've been there with the protesters standing in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en people. Uh, and I, again, I, I have to echo the sentiment that it's completely uh, uh, despicable, it's, it's unacceptable, the, the idea of this pipeline being pushed through uh, Wet'suwet'en territory, uh, particularly in light of the government's uh, verbal commitments to undrip, uh, which you haven't, uh, haven't materialized, that is the United Nations Declaration um, on the Rights of Indigenous People. And you know, I'm just going to cut in, even more than that to me, it's the environmental issue. Are they completely insane? I mean, Australia is ablaze, the poles are melting, everybody knows that climate change is a disaster that we already can't escape, and yet, there, what is wrong with the politicians who run this province and country? This makes no sense. The age of natural gas and oil really is over if we want to save the lives of basically everybody on this planet and especially the younger people because it is not going to be pretty what's coming. Uh, no, I agree. It's certainly not going to be pretty. But of course, we have to remember the extremely powerful interests at play uh, from, you know, the oil companies uh, and, and energy industry and mining companies that, uh, that have so much money to make over this. And, and I think furthermore, it's important to remember that Climate change doesn't affect us all equally, and, and for, for the people who have the money, they can afford to, to live uh, on the hills away from the smog. They can afford to live in places safe from some of the worst effects of climate change, whether it's the flooding or the fires, and they can uh, afford to make sure that they have you know, uh, uh, everything they need in, in case of emergency. Uh, so uh, this is certainly something I think we need to think about from a class perspective. I'll just mention that the Bush family, no doubt on behalf of a lot of moneyed interest, has purchased a 100,000 hectare estate in Paraguay that sits atop one of the largest freshwater aquifers in the world. So the rich are positioning themselves where they can uh, escape from the disaster that they are bringing upon us, and we're bringing upon ourselves. I mean, we're all part of it. But I think we'd all like to do a bit better, mm -hmm. but they just won't let us. I mean, they just won't let us change. Well, absolutely. And they're not only positioning themselves safely, but they're, they're looking to profit off climate change, which I think is, is more cynical than, than anything, right? But um, I mean, in, in looking again at the politicians and why they're making some of these decisions, uh, I, I also ran in the, in the provincial election in 2017. And uh, while I didn't run against John Horgan, I took the opportunity to go talk to him. Uh, after one of his events when I, I had read that he'd been having these fundraisers for $10,000 a plate with uh, unnamed resource industry leaders. And I asked him, you know, what do these otherwise business savvy corporations expect to get in return for, for this, sort of, uh, this sort of money? And he, he said nothing at first, right? And I pressed him on this because, of course, corporations don't, don't expect nothing from $10,000 donations. But uh, I think we know. I think we know now in hindsight precisely what they expected, right? Yeah, the level of corruption, I, I call it corruption in our provincial government and federal government. And what I mean when I say corruption is they pretend they're working for us, but they know that's a lie. That's just the, the act that all of them, all of our provincial leaders and our federal leaders, John Horgan, Justin Trudeau, Jason Kenney, you know, Stephen Harper, before the the leadership, they know the game, and the game is they work for big business. Big business runs this country. We've got to get past that because everybody's life is now at risk and we're just not doing it. 
I, I absolutely agree, and, and corruption is absolutely the, the, the best word for it. I mean, whether it's legalized or illegal corruption, uh, because again, in the, the bourgeois democracy we have under capitalism, right? I mean, it, it, it allows for this sort of manipulation by big moneyed interests, right? And, and, and in more ways than one. Uh, you know, they, they pressure us, for example, if we try and impose some kind of environmental restrictions or raise the minimum wage, they threaten us to, to leave the country. They say, you know, business can't operate in this kind of environment and they'll just pack up and leave. It's not as though uh, big business has any uh, loyalty uh, to, to one country or other, whether it's a Canadian corporation or, or, or from somewhere else, right? It's, it's, uh, and that's why, you know, the Communist Party, and, and I've always believed very strongly in this, thinks see, we need democratic ownership over these sorts of industries in order to have a real democracy. Uh, you know, politically, right? It needs to extend to the economy. So let's take an industry like um, restaurants. How would those be owned? Well, I, I think restaurants is something a little bit different. When, when the uh, Communist Party calls for public ownership, they're, they're referring mostly to large industries and major resources and, and vital things like energy, uh, banks and insurance. And, and that sort of thing. Okay, so let's talk about banks. Yes. We've got six major banks in the country and a few smaller ones and the credit unions. Mm -hmm. What would, would the, I mean, to me, I would have no problem with a few of the banks being nationalized. Yes. And a few being private. And then we can see what works. I don't know what the Communist Party's thought is on that. Oh, well, well certainly. I mean, the amount of profit that is, is recorded by Canada's five largest banks uh, you know, yearly is, is grows all the time and it's absolutely staggering and the amount of things that we could afford to do with this kind of money if these banks were nationalized um, uh, free education for everyone many times over. That's true. Uh, that's just one, that's of, true. one of a number of things, right? Just but from the bank's profits for one year that could pay for that. Absolutely. And the housing crisis in beginning tomorrow, yes. if we could get our hands on. I mean, they, how much does, I mean, Royal Bank, I don't know how much it makes now, at least 12 billion a year, at least 12 billion a year. Record profits every year, it's a new record. Mm -hmm. I mean, and we don't even tax them at, at any rate that they should be paying. And it's never talked about, it's not even an issue. In the last federal election, it was taxing the banks or the oil companies. You know, oh my God, Precisely. how dare one. Yeah, no, and if we had a national bank, uh, then, you know, this bank could lend us money at no interest. And we do have a national bank. Well, uh, <laughs> of a sort, Yeah. right? Not, a, not in the socialist way, however. But we do have the Bank of Canada. Yes. It just doesn't do anything. No. It, but it, it could. It could solve a lot of our problems. But it just, they make sure, our politicians and the corporations, that the Bank of Canada does nothing. No, it, it operates to, to make profit, right, for the, for the investors, not for, not for Canada, not for the working class people. Yeah. Housing. Absolutely. Um, I'll just say this. I phoned up Victoria City Hall and I sent an email to Victoria and Saanich councils yesterday. So it was, I asked for an answer quickly today, but it's short. What I asked was, there are vast amounts, I mean, in Victoria, if you go up, uh, government or Douglas or Blanchard from downtown to Mayfair Mall it's all one story retail and parking lots massive coverage of parking lots. and I asked why isn't that so none of it's zoned for housing and then if you go into Saanich as you move past Mayfair Mall up to Uptown Mall just that little area there is a huge area of undeveloped land it's parking lots and car dealerships again we're in a housing crisis and I'm wondering why our city councils won't zone the land for housing. So that was my question, and maybe by next show we'll have an answer. Mm -hmm. And of course, you probably see it more as a provincial and federal issue, which is where the money is to build the housing. Uh, yeah, absolutely, right. And of course, uh, the municipal government only has uh, limited abilities. But uh, they can zone. But they can zone. But uh, is, is zoning merely enough? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I think this is a systemic issue where housing is being treated as a commodity, not a, not a, a human right, as is viewed by the UN, right? And, and not only that, uh, you know, we've got a lot of tinkering that goes on and, and these little changes they make that really do a lot of benefit to developers, right? And this has made a lot of money for developers, but the housing doesn't really end up being affordable for, for most working people. As I, again, as we have a housing crisis here. The, the, the cost of housing has gone up uh, exponentially, uh, it, you know, over the last number of years. It's, it's uh, really quite dramatic and um, uh, 
uh, it's making it extremely difficult for, for people to get by. It's creating dangerous situations. People don't want to even, you know, report unsafe conditions in their homes to their landlords because they're afraid of it being used as an excuse to rent evict them. Uh, so there's a lot of layers to this, this crisis. And I think, you know, what we need is massive uh, investment by the federal government to create a, a, a national housing program as, you know, as is standard in most, uh, you know, in industrialized countries in the world. Canada's really an exception uh, that we don't have such a program. Yeah, to me, it seems like the housing crisis has been deliberately created. Once the feds and the province got out of building housing 20 or 30 years ago, um, the corporate housing industry said, well, if we create a shortage, just imagine what we can do. And prices have tripled, rents have doubled, and imagine where all that money is flowing to. I mean, it's a brilliant plan, totally evil. <laughs> but brilliant and that's the way this country is run. No, a absolutely right and, and that's why I think it's so important we be talking about systemic change because these aren't things that can can be altered with just a, a minor sort of uh, fix here and there. This is something inherent to the capitalist system as long as we have this sort of massive inequality and you know these powerful corporations and developers who have the power to influence uh, uh, the way our, our politics are decided. I mean we certainly can't say we're living in a democracy. Uh, and, you know, I think that's why uh, uh, so many people are interested in, in, in the Communist Party, as you mentioned, you know, talking to me after debates. Uh, I, a poll last year showed that 58% uh, of Canadians uh, view the term socialism positively. And I think this is a very good step in the right direction. So if the Communist Party were suddenly the government of Canada today, and you happen to be influential with uh, the Prime Minister's office, what kind of stuff would the Communist Party want to start to do? And you've um, only got two minutes. Okay, well, uh, that's unfortunate because we have a massive program and I could talk all day about uh, the many changes we'd like to make. But I think an important one to talk about in light of what's going on with the Wet'suwet'en is the importance of creating a new constitution uh, uh, in which, you know, the many nations of Canada are given uh, full rights to self-determination, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, up to and including the right to secession, right? A new voluntary constitution that includes Indigenous peoples, you know, First Nations, Quebec, Métis, Acadians, and English-speaking Canada. Uh, but, I mean, in terms of the environment, we need to immediately uh, nationalize the, the energy and, and uh, you know, uh, major industries uh, in order to shut down the tar sands and provide uh, jobs with equal pay in other industries, right? Uh, I, I think the carbon tax is, is really uh, one of those, again, sort of small sort of fixes that doesn't really do the job. Um, it turns carbon into a commodity. Uh, rather than actually placing a hard cap on, on you know, what, uh, what we need to do. And, and you know, uh, frankly, I think a lot of these polluters need to be to jailed <laughs> for the, uh, the, the crimes they've uh, com committed against this planet and, and working class people. Tyson, thank you very much. Pleasure. Yeah. Thank you all for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. <laughs>